Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Holy Spirit and spirituality. This particular lesson, which is lesson number seven in that series for February 18 of 2017, is entitled The Holy Spirit and the Fruit of the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> You, if you're familiar with Galatians 5, 22 and 23, you will already know um, a lot about what this lesson will, will talk about. But before we begin, as usual, we'd like to offer, ask you to join us in a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we come before you now recognizing your presence with us and asking your guidance, the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we seek to discuss what is in this lesson and what is in your word May we make it clear, not only to our own minds, but to those who might be listening in, as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson you couldn't do much without going straight to Galatians 5, so let's do that. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Spirit produces love. Notice that's the first characteristic. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these. So that's a pretty straightforward. And of course, in the verses before that, it talks about all the opposites, which are pretty awful. Um, so what do we learn from those verses about our relationship to the Holy Spirit? Well, one of the things that we're going to talk about quite a bit here is the fact that the fruit is singular in verse 22. Why would Paul keep it in the singular as opposed to saying the fruits of the Spirit are all these things? Um, is God trying to tell us through Paul that somehow or other these things are a package, that they come together, that they um, you can't have one without the other? Um, well, I think we would all agree that all of these characteristics were present in the person of Jesus Christ. I don't think anyone would question that. So thus it would be fair, I think, to say that if we could live lives after the pattern of Jesus Christ, that should be our goal. Uh, and we need to recognize, of course, also that this is not something we can do on our own. We may try as hard as we can, but we're not going to be able to develop all those characteristics on our own. I remember reading an article which some of you no doubt have read about Benjamin Franklin. He set out 13 things he wanted to accomplish and he you know, down through the list and finally the last one on the list was humility and he said, I was so good that I just know how it could be possibly be humble. Uh, so <laughs> we might have some of that kind of problem with our, our uh, mm -hmm. looking at all these things. Well. John suggests, in John 15, verses 1 to 12, uh, a, a pattern or a possible way to go about this. This is a familiar passage. Look at it again. I'm reading from my Good News Bible. I am the real vine, and my Father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does not bear fruit, so that it will be clean and bear uh, that does bear fruit, I'm sorry, so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can do so only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. Now, it's interesting that Jesus would use those words just as he's about to leave them. You can't do anything without me, but bye. <laughs> you know, but that's really what's happening here. He knew that. They didn't know that. So this is part of his speech that he apparently was giving them on his way from the upper room to Gethsemane. Verse 7 says that, uh, or is it, is it? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, mm -hmm. 
it's his words, it's his communication. Yeah. It, that's what it, it's always going to be, and that's... I was just about to get there. Verse 6 says, Whoever goes, does not remain in me or abide in me is thrown out like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire where they are burnt. And then your verse, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish and you shall have it. Think how many Christians down through the generations have tried to claim that promise. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit, and in this way you become my disciples. I love you just as a Father loves me. Imagine that. We go back to John 6, 63. Mm -hmm. The words I have spoken yeah. are spirit and life. I mean, it's mm -hmm. so succinct and, 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 and to the point. And, uh, yeah. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy, now you recognize that several things that we're going to be talking about from Galatians 5 are mentioned here, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love one another just as I love you. So, uh, you know, you got the word joy twice there, mm -hmm. and then you get over to chapter uh, 16, you got that my joy may be full, excuse me, yep. that your joy may be full. And you get to chapter 17, again, the same thing, that joy, uh, that's verse 13. Yeah. Uh, it is joy. Yeah. And, and uh, I love it. So this is, this is a question. I mean, how many people living in our world today really believe that if we live Christ-like lives, we would be the happiest, the most joyful people in the world? Do people really believe that? Do people who are trying to be Christians really believe that? The question is, what is the role of the Word? Mm -hmm. Because in verse 7, it could also be translated to say, if you remain in my Word, mm -hmm. then you remain in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, it is the Word that drives us to Christ, not Christ that drives us to the Word. Right. He is a message that we must listen to. Mm -hmm. Very good. He was a message as well as a messenger. Yeah. And the only, only entity or person that was also the message and the messenger. So these characteristics, these nine characteristics we're going to talk about, do you think some of them could be developed by human effort? Well, the word certainly couldn't have come by human effort. No. It is a message that goes against the grain of humanity all the way. It wouldn't be the fruit of the Spirit then. It would be the fruit, the fruit of, of some, our own some other tree. Yeah. Well, um, does now one of the arguments that has come up, they've been discussed by Christians, is does bearing a much fruit in John 15 involve developing the fruit of the spirit that we're going to talk about today, or does it involve bringing others to the gospel? I mean, bearing fruit means you, you bring people in. Which is it? But you're bringing them into a particular message, or based upon a particular message. I mean, if it's not a f true message, if it's not the truth, then you've really done them no favors or no for us. Yeah. Yeah. Gary, were you going to come in? Or? Um, well, bearing fruit to me is, is, is bearing blessings on mm -hmm. other people. Um, a person who bears a lot of fruit I think would do that a lot. And that could come from all kinds of angles, mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether it's love or, or just working for people, helping them out, doing, you know, making their lives better even, mm -hmm. even inventing things that make people's lives better. People go out to dig wells for people to to give them water. You know that just helps their lives like crazy. Exactly. So you've got so fruits a pretty broad thing as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, Francis Francis of Assisi used to say, "Preach always, and if you must, use words." Yeah. Exactly. Which implies that first you have to have the fruit for yourself before others might. Yeah. be interested in yeah. recognizing mm -hmm. the fruit. 
Well, and this is the ultimate question for our lesson today, I think, is if we really, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, if we really had all nine of these characteristics, would it be obvious to people around us? Would it attract them? Would well, either attract them or repel them, depending yeah. on their, mm -hmm. what their nature was. So if, we, if we're going to say that these traits are really what Jesus was like, did Jesus attract people widely? Why do you say that? Because he was crucified by the majority, so you couldn't use the word widely. There were a lot of people who yeah. followed him, who appreciated his message, even though they did not understand it at first. So if there are verses that say, and I, I'm not going to take time to look them up right now, that say that people came to him from Decapolis, from Tyre, from Sidon, from Jordan, from Idumea, from all the countries around. So why, why were they attracted to him? Yeah, there's meaning. He has a lot of okay. meaning to life. Um, hope. There's probably ideas about the future, who you are, and there's probably um, value put to the person who comes. Okay. What kind of value? I mean, think of all the people he healed, for example. I mean, if you were crippled or you were, you know, had some serious disease and you lived in one of the surrounding countries, where would you go? Well, you got to remember that there were some people that got healed and they took off and only one came back to him yeah. also. And the one that came back was from one of the surrounding countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Christians talk about justification by faith, sanctification by faith, salvation by faith, and we could go on. So what's the common theme in all those things? Obviously, it's faith. So what is faith? Uh, the best definition I know of, because I think this is key to our developing these characteristics, was something I learned from my mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, here at Loma Linda. He spent a lot of time working on this definition, I know personally. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We can't say will be because think about Lucifer. I mean, it's not like he didn't have any exposure to God, and yet he chose to rebel against him. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. That is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that like Abraham, look at Genesis 18, 22 to 33, Job, look at Job 42, 7 and 8, and Moses, see Exodus 32, 5 to 14, and Numbers 14, 11 to 25, who are God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. So what kind of people do you dare to ask why of? Somebody that is not, that is not insecure. That, okay. that truly does have knowledge and, and, and has a message. But you wouldn't want to do it to somebody that is a bully or somebody that's insecure. Mm -hmm. Why do you add that word reverent? Reverent? Yeah, when you ask, reverently ask him why. Well, because reverent, uh, respectfully, would be another word, respectfully. So respectfully or yeah. mm -hmm. um, in a way that you're humble. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes. Yeah, I think that uh, Jesus is the first guru, you might say, <laughs> who brought a message that made sense. Mm -hmm. As compared to all the others, even within Judaism, whose messages did not add up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Well, he's, he's very good at antidotes. 
mm -hmm. you know, that that it actually comes out with stories, and it that's one reason why it makes sense is because yeah. you can you can relate to the stories and you can zero in on the meaning because of that. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to be careful with uh, an interpretation of faith such as we have it since the 14th century. Uh, it is oftentimes believed that it is a statement for which there is incomplete evidence. Mm. And uh, that is not what Jesus was preaching. He no. was preaching a message for which there is all the evidence possible yep. because who can argue with love as the only way of life to have eternal life? I mean, that makes sense. It's mm -hmm. logical. There's no other way to look at it. Yeah, but, you know, doubt. Um, sometimes if a person wants to doubt, you can give them all the evidence in the world and they're yeah. still going to doubt because... Helen White says that very clearly in Steps of Christ, page 105. Yeah. Not all the evidence in the world is going to keep some people from doubting. That's right. So, yeah. actually, doubt is kind of the opposite of faith. Mm hmm think about it. So how do we develop faith? John, I mean, sorry, Romans well, 10, 17 says yeah, what? We're given a measure of faith okay. to start with at least. Well, uh, Romans, Romans 10, 17 says it comes through the Word, doesn't it? So in other words, you can't have a relationship with somebody unless you get to know them. Right. And we can't we're not, we can't do as the disciples did and walk around with him through Galilee and, and Judea, but we can get to know him through his word. And, of course, as you already point out, Fred, that's the word and Jesus is sort of used interchangeably in, in Scripture, in the New Testament, of course. Eternal life is that they know thee, the only yep. true God. So knowledge is obviously a key here. Mm -hmm. A false knowledge of God is an idol. And he says, don't worship idols, worship the only true God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in order to have a living, thriving relationship with Jesus Christ, we must, we must have Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Those are the things, those are the ways in which we get to know Jesus. Why, why is witnessing important? I mean, we can understand why we, God talks to us and we talk back to Him. It's pretty obvious why those things are necessary for a relationship. But why is witnessing necessary for a relationship? Well, First, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Well, uh, because it's uh, the product of love. It's driven by okay. love. If you don't witness, you don't share what you have, then how can you say you have love for these okay. people? That's one very important part of it. There's another part that I am very well aware of, well aware of because of the teaching I do. If you want to figure out whether you know or you understand something, try to teach somebody else. If you can't, if you can't figure out how to teach it, why, well, you, better, you better go back to the books. Yourself might be the biggest beneficiary yeah. of, of it because it yeah. pushes you to study. And then when you get uh, somebody has a different slant on things it makes you study even even more yeah. so it, it, you the individual that is attempting to, to witness is possibly benefiting more there are four kinds of love mentioned in the new testament we're not going to focus on the other three kind but we're going to talk about agape love what's what's special about agape love all you greek scholars <laughs> it's an altruistic love mm -hmm generally speaking, but I think we have to be very careful not to assume that the word agape represents the kind of love that Jesus was talking about. It's a, it comes point, the closest, but it's still... The closest, but yeah. it's still a distance away. Yeah. When uh, uh, Demas left Paul, Paul lamented the fact that Demas left, saying he left us because of his agape of the world. Mm -hmm. which tells you that even the word agape in Greek does not have a totally altruistic yeah. meaning because how can you have agape for the world? <laughs> it was not an altruistic. Yeah. I, I work in a low-income clinic in San Bernardino, as most of you know, and you discover something in that setting which, is, which is really reveals something to people, I, I think. The people who are the worst off are the ones who probably need the most help. 
I mean, that may seem obvious, but when they come in, I mean, the people you would least likely want to hug or love are the ones who probably need your help the most. And that's the time when agape has to come to play. These aren't the people who, you know, oh yeah, isn't this exciting, I'm so glad to see you. You have to say, oh no, so-and-so is back, but you have to love them. And you love them because of their need, not because you just have this overwhelming feeling for them. You, you, and if you do, the response is incredible because a lot of these people just haven't had anybody love them. I, I know so many of my patients who've had relatives shot uh, and killed and all kind of live in very difficult circumstances, many of them. But if you, if you really reach out to them, the response is incredible. So an agape in that sense could be uh, showing value to these people, you mm -hmm. know, that they are valuable, that they mm -hmm. have worth, and that would be one way to well, express it. If For God so loved the world yeah. that he gave his only begotten son, that shows immense value, Yeah, yeah, yeah. infinite. Well, if we develop this kind of a faith relationship, this kind of a love relationship, um, would it change us? How long would it be before we would see the second coming, do you think? I think that's the whole problem. We have not yet fully understood, not so much the word agape, but God's definition of yeah. love. Therefore, if we don't understand it, how can we live it? A little bit like the apostles who said, if we don't know where you're going, how can we go there? Yeah. And at that point in time, they didn't know that yeah. where we are going is towards greater and ever greater love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ellen White has some absolutely astounding words in Desire of Ages, page 668, paragraph 3. I would like to read next. How would this impact us if we really develop this, the fruit of the Spirit? All true obedience, that's part of it, comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, that's that faith relationship, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, so remember we talked about faith being that relationship, when we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience to an appreciation of the character of Christ, that would be all the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. What an incredible comment. If you consent, how long will it take you to obtain those things? Well, she says you will. Yeah. But there's no, she gives you no it idea no how time. long it's going to take for it to happen. I, I, I would be inclined to think that if we will, we will continue becoming more and more like God for the rest of eternity. And it's, it's moving in that direction that counts. It's not, God, Jesus isn't asking us to be perfect, you know, tomorrow. No, he says, I've got it. Uh, let's, let's take a walk together. And so long as we're moving along in that path, he says, this is great. Even if sometimes we don't move very fast, or even sometimes we fall off the path. We get back on, and we're moving along with, with God, with Jesus. He says, that's what counts. So if the Lord hasn't come yet, we haven't crossed that threshold yet? Or is it because we're not trying hard enough? I, I personally think that the Lord hasn't come yet because well, it says this. I mean, I, I don't need to Second uh, Peter three, because we're not we're not solid enough. We're not, he, he, you know. He he says if he would let the let the devil have full access to us, we we would just collapse. And God says, I can't do that. I, w I want you. I want as many people as possible to be saved. I, I think you're right when you say that our love will continue to grow for eternity. But I do believe that before the Lord can come back, mm. we need to reach a level of love that is sufficient 
mm -hmm. though not perfect, but maybe, mm -hmm. but sufficient to vindicate God yeah. in front of the universe that has been against him. Uh, I'm talking about the angels of, of evil. Yeah. And they need to recognize that us, little yeah. mortal beings that we are, agree with God and his way of governing the, the universe. Satan, remember, in the great controversy has always claimed that none of us would ever really love God because we really want to. If we were really given freedom, we would follow him. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 17 and 18, I'm reading now from the New American Standard Bible, every good tree bears good fruit, <coughs> but the rotten tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree produce good fruit. So, he seemed to be pretty clear about where the where things how, where the things come out and where they're where they're headed. Second Timothy three five, using the New Living Translation, Paul says, "People will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly." So, what's the difference between living a religious life and a life that's filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, they would be responding to external cues with the idea of what's in it for me, uh, as opposed to uh, internal cues, what's in it for God's glory and to bless others. Would you call the Pharisees religious? Sure. By their own standards, for sure. Yeah. They were very religious. What about um, the Paul, other? Paul's Paul, Mars Hill. Yeah. Paul was religious before, he was yeah. religious after. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, he was godly afterwards, I would say. But have we, have we seen both sides yet? I mean, we here. I mean, in this that, time. That's, a, that's the question I was going to ask you. Do you, um, is there a difference between Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians that's noticeable? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about Pentecost, mm -hmm. when the tongues of fire came out, mm -hmm. would we be seeing something there that we haven't seen here yet happen? Yeah. Think One so? thing we would see is that uh, Ellen White says very clearly that those people upon whom the stung of, tongues of fire came down, from that time on for the rest of their lives, they could speak fluently in any language wherever they went. They could speak that language fluently. That's not the the gift of tongues that some people talk about, but they, they, they really could. Well, here's the question that we need to ask, and I'm going to ask you out there. Is the average Seventh-day Adventist really a better Christian than the average Baptist or Methodist or Catholic? Well, the, the Lord sends his blessings on, on the good and the bad, you know. I mean, he sends his rain to fall on etc. So I, I think we're in the eyes of the Lord run to and fro mm -hmm. through all the earth. So I, I think anyone who uh, are in these other uh, disciplines could respond. If they're responding to sure. God's grace, they could, they could be fruitful. Mm -hmm. But are they, are, are we any fruitful than them right now? Well, we, I don't think we, we say should compare ourselves with one another, that Paul says we're without understanding if we're trying to compare ourselves with one another. From uh, what we are saying mm -hmm. on this table tonight, religion is all about love. Mm -hmm. Because love bears the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. It is love that produces all of these other characteristics that we were looking at in Galatians mm -hmm. chapter 2. Yeah. Therefore, and true religion is becoming increasingly and ever more loving. Yeah. And of course, to support you, what did Matt, what did Jesus say to the lawyer who came and said, you know, what's real religion? Love God and love your neighbor. Yeah. Those are the great commandments. Well, um, and of course, you go a step beyond that in many people's minds, Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. I mean, where does that come from? That's certainly not any natural ten tendency in, in our human characteristics, our human natures. So here's 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 a conundrum. Look at Matthew. I'm sorry, John chapter 13, verse 35. 
This is a familiar passage. In fact, we should really start with verse 34. And now I give you, again, this is John 5, uh, 13. It's in the upper room. And, I, and now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Now that's why I asked that question a moment ago. Does everyone know that we are his disciples because of the way we love each other? If we're more concerned about spirituality in its traditional context than we are love. Mm -hmm. and as long as we don't put love first, we're not being spiritual yeah. or religious. Well, it's interesting to note that the two chapters that talk the most about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, we're not talking about, we'll talk about gifts next week, but the two chapters that talk most about the gifts of the Spirit are 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. And what's right between those two chapters? Love. The love chapter. That's got to have, that, that, that has to say something to us. In fact, as we're going to see, just, just look at that just really quick right now. Look at 1 Corinthians 13 and look at what leads up to it. Set your hearts, this is verse tw uh, chapter 12, verse uh, 31. Set your hearts then on the more important gifts. So what would be the most important gift? Best of all, however, is the following way, and then he, she, he talks about love. And when you get to the end of the love chapter, what does it says? Verse 13, 13, verse 13. Meanwhile, these three remain faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So it sounds like when we get to talk about gifts, we're even when we're talking about gifts, the greatest one is still going to be love, isn't it? And chapter 14, verse 1, it is love then that you should strive for. So, there are a lot of questions. I don't, and I don't need to tell any of you that, and you people out there probably are familiar with this as well. There are a lot of Christian groups who feel like the key, the proof that you're a real Christian is to be able to speak in tongues. What, what, which, what should we say to people like that? We've said that the real key should be true love. Um, is speaking in tongues evidence of love? No, nobody has lots of experience in speaking in tongues? I've heard some situations where a person says, well, you're not spiritual enough because you don't speak in tongues, and they use that as their test of, of whatever, the way you measure up to their uh, standard, and it's kind of a parting shot, or sometimes they'll say, well, I'll be praying for you. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a put down to, to people too, even though it, they may think that they're doing it, uh, for the uh, right reason. And the right reason, but it doesn't always come across that way. Well, I mean, obviously they're trying to convince you to, to be a good Christian like they are. Right. <laughs> but Paul sa says in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, or he asks, I think it's in, you know, he asked the rhetorical question, do all speak in tongues? Yeah. Um, as well as all of these others, you know, that there's different gifts. So he's he's saying, in essence, that no not everybody speaks in tongues. Well, he was Are these people unspiritual? <laughs> yeah, and he was saying that, that he talks in more tongues than, than most of the others there. Mm. And of course, he could, we probably had what, Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and probably maybe some other dialects. Yeah. So, uh, but if it's not uh, edifying to the ones that you're communicating with, either right. that or you're trying to just mislead people. I have had the very interesting experience of practicing medicine in five different languages in my life. Mm. Actually communicating with patients in five different languages, not, not just a few words, I mean actually taking care of patients in five different languages. Um, and I don't, I, I, people say that I'm, I'm good at languages, I'm not nearly as good as some people I know, but um, I say, you know, you just got to be willing to step out, make mistakes in the language until you learn how to do it. So, okay, let's talk about joy, the next in the list in Galatians 5. Um, and I have some very interesting words from Ellen White. I want you to th tell me what you think of this. Smile, parents. 
smile, teachers. If your heart is sad, let not your face reveal the fact. Let the sunshine from a loving, grateful heart light up the countenance. Unbend from your iron dignity. Adapt yourselves to the children's needs. He's talking particularly about people who are teachers. And make them love you. You must win their affection if you would impress religious truth upon their heart. Now, wouldn't that be also true if you were trying to win an adult? I think so. So is that being phony? Do you smile when you're sad? Well, there are always things to, that we could dwell on that could make us sad, and there are things that we could dwell on that could make us happy. So mm -hmm. We can think of, uh, in every, you know, Paul says in First Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks, uh, and uh, also rejoice in the Lord always. So, but he's not saying to give thanks for everything. He's say, saying in any situation mm -hmm. we can give thanks, and that giving of thanks can lift us above the situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we could use Paul's example. What about our example today? We may live in all kinds of difficulties, uh, our friends might die, uh, there's terrible things, people shootings and all kinds of awful things going on in our world, but we know as Seventh-day Adventists with a clear understanding of the great controversy that the war, the real war has already been won. Jesus Christ won the great controversy. There's no doubt about that. There's no way he can lose because the war is already over. And so if we choose to join his side, we have an absolute guarantee, absolute guarantee of being on the winning side. So, I mean, isn't that enough reason to be happy or joyous? Maybe well, not to be, you know, that's, that's, hilarious, but... That's good reason, but um, joy is kind of emotion. It's not really something that will, that you just think about something and all of a sudden you just start smiling all the time. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Yeah. But, but you know, if you start thinking about holding back what you feel inside, mm -hmm. well, when Jesus wept, mm -hmm. should he have not done that, but had a stiff upper lip and, yeah. and just kept smiling the whole time? Um, because, you know, everything, you know, when somebody dies, they're going to be raised again. He could have thought of that and smiled all the yeah. time. But it's true. But um, so there's, there's probably reasons. But he was reasons. identifying, I think, with what everybody was, you know, when somebody yeah. dies, there is the mourners and the ones who cry. And, and they responded with, well, see how, how great a love he has for him. Yeah. So. Uh, there could be a purpose in that. It's, it's interesting to notice that the time when Jesus really wept <coughs> was on the Mount of Olives as he's looking over at Jerusalem and he realizes that they're not going to respond to his love. I mean, he knew. He wept probably for a minute or two in, at Lazarus's grave. But, I mean, he just, you know, if you read Desire of Ages, he just poured out his grief, as he's looking, coming over the brim of the Mount of Olives, and he's looking across at that beautiful temple, beautiful temple where the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees held court, basically, where they, they, were in, they were responsible. And he just thought, you know, just wailed. Well, look at John 14, 27 as an example of something that goes along with joy. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give you, do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. Is that, uh, is that a reason to be happy? Romans 14, 17 says, For God's kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of the righteousness, peace, and joy which the Holy Spirit gives. So what does the Holy Spirit give along with joy? Righteousness and peace. Does having the right relationship with Jesus Christ produce joy and peace? Should, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is writing from the Mamertine prison. I don't know how many of you out there have had the privilege of visiting Rome at some time, but 
there's that dungeon, really. I mean, it's carved out of solid rock. And in Paul's day, you, now there's a, they've, they've made it, they've dug a, they have built a stairway down so you can walk down the stairways. But in those days, there was nothing but a hole about that big at the top, and they would let people down through that hole, and there was a drain, a little bit of a drain out the bottom so you could drain out waste stuff. But I mean, imagine living in that thing. And while he's there, he writes, 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you think he knew something about persecution? He knew that he was about to be killed by Nero. I mean, do you think he had any doubt in his mind about that? I doubt it. So why should a person be joyful about such persecution or such pain and suffering? Well, the only possibility that I can think of is that he knows what he knows what he knows or he knew what was beyond the grave. He knew about Jesus Christ. And I think that he knew something beyond that. He knew that his testimony would affect others to recognize the beauty of this capacity a person can have being joyful even under such circumstances. Yeah. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Now that we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is that always true? I mean, haven't we been put right with God, with God to Christ? If we, if we claim to be Christians, that should be true, right? Was Jesus always peaceful? Would you say in all of his circumstances, even up to that final week, would you say he was peaceful? When he's being whipped and skin torn off his back and bleeding and all that kind of stuff, was he peaceful? And before that, when he was sweating blood. Well, we mentioned Second Peter 3 a little earlier. Look at Second Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, that is, to come again, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed but he wants all to turn away from their sins. Now, does he know that all are going to turn away from their sins? He knows that they're not going to, doesn't he? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting that patience, or another word for that might be endurance, even a, a more hardy kind of patience, is one of the characteristics of the final group of people who worship God at the end. Remember Revelation 14:12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Calls for endurance. It certainly does not even need to be mentioned that patience is not a natural human characteristic. But it should also be, I mean, I, I think about that. Fairly often I have people come into me to, to be seen as patients, and they've got a, a busted hand. Why is their hand busted? Well, they hit somebody or they hit a wall even, you know, and they broke a bone. Why? I mean, is, is there any rational reason for hitting a wall? <laughs> I can't think of any, you know, at the point where you break your hand. But people do it. It should be obvious that impatience will not make us fit for the kingdom of heaven. Do you experience joy, peace, and patience in your life on a daily basis? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, it says that patience, people who are, who have loving, who are loving are patient and kind, not jealous or conceited or proud. So think how patient God was and how kind he was toward the children of Israel. And I... One of the best verses for that is Hosea 11. Just incredible. The Lord says, When Israel was a child, I loved him and called him out of Egypt as my son. But the more I called to him, the more he turned away from me. My people sacrificed to Baal. They burnt incense to idols. Yet, it was, yet I was the one who taught Israel to walk. I took my people up in my arms, but they did not acknowledge that I took care of them. 
I drew them to me with affection and love. I picked them up and held them to my cheek. I bent down to them and fed them. And despite all that, they rebelled against him to the point where finally God had to say, I'm sorry. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him go. So sad. Um, if we see somebody doing something wrong, how should we respond? Depends on the circumstances, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, if we respond in some kind of angry or, you know, unfriendly way, is that likely to help them? Probably not. One of the really ultimate characteristics of a, of a loving Christian is to respond in kindness when somebody else is angry or, or you know, just, hurtful. huh? When somebody's hurtful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, look at Ephesians 5, verse 9 is another uh, one here. For it is the light that brings a rich harvest of every kind of goodness, righteousness, and truth. So there Paul associates goodness with righteousness and truth. Um, another characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. What is faithfulness? Can depend on somebody. Depend okay. On Trustworthiness, maybe? Mm -hmm. Can you think of another word, maybe? Reliability? Maybe one of the most amazing things about God is the way he keeps his promises. Isn't that trustworthiness? Yeah, but basically when he says, if you have love, you have all of these things. Yeah. You have joy. You, have, you are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. How can you be untrustworthy if you have love? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jesus Christ himself in, in the book of Revelation is described as a faithful witness. If we're faithful, are we reflecting the image of God? Here's the words of Ellen White once again. This is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, way back in the early years of her life. It is not the great results we attain, but the motives from which we act that weigh with God. He prizes goodness and faithfulness more than the greatness of the work accomplished. That's Testimonies, Volume 2, page 510, 511. Well, Galatians 5.23 and Matthew 5.5 5 go together. Humility and self-control are not natural human characteristics, but Jesus himself told us that the humble will receive what God has promised. Why, why, why does God value humility so much? There's no love without it. Can you think of some person in the Bible who was described as very meek and humble? Oh, Moses. Well, Jesus, of course, but Moses too, wasn't he? Described as the meekest man on the earth. How do you suppose... Think about pride as the opposite. Okay, and that's, I was about to say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about everything that you know about Satan. It's the opposite of humility, humbleness, I mean, he's proud, he's envious, he wants God's position. The meek are not boisterous, quarrelsome, or selfishly aggressive. They go about their daily lives ex exhibiting a gentle spirit. Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 32, it is better to be patient than powerful. It is better to win control over yourself than over whole cities. I think Solomon had experience in winning over cities. He was a pretty, pretty phenomenal. He wasn't as good as his father, but he was a pretty good general on his own. Well, the last of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. What kind of self-control are we talking about here? Is this the, is this the, um, what was it, what's it called? Um, yeah. the, the Greeks that could stand just still even though... Stoic. Yeah. Stoic. The Stoics Stoic. is what I was trying to think of, yeah. Is this Stoicism? Is that what this self-control is talking about? Probably not. It's 
scholar, you're looking after the well-being and welfare of others, regardless of the circumstances. Okay. I think it comes down to the will, and, and a lot of things in the kingdom are sort of the opposite of what we think of them in the world. You know, we're rich and yet we're poor, or we're poor and yet we're rich. Uh, mm -hmm. So self-control is is more of a sub subjecting ourselves to God, submitting, you know, submitting our yeah. will to God so that he can work out his will in us yeah. as opposed to our, us asserting yeah. our will over other people okay. and controlling them. If you told a typical um, executive, uh, someone in high position, or maybe somebody in Hollywood, okay, you can have self-control, well, how do they interpret that? I can do whatever I want to do, right? Isn't that the way they, the world usually interprets that? But that's not what God had in mind here at all. He says, the person who is really loving, Fred, as you mentioned, and really is starting to exhibit all these other characteristics that come about of his, as a result of love, what happens? These people get to know God so well, and they realize what an incredible person he is. They want to be like him. So they will do what is right because it is right. It, it just seems like the right thing to do. We, the quotation we read earlier. Well, I think one of the raw meanings of this is if, you, if you, something comes up where you get angry, you're going to keep under control and keep your, keep your wits about you mm -hmm. type of thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of self-control, too. Yeah. Um, when you... If you drink, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of self-control can you have to yeah. keep it away? And, and there's all kinds of things that can come up to, to tempt you to do something, and you need to have that yeah. self-control to keep it from happening. So that's more of a raw definition of it, I think. Well, in, in modern language, here, here's, a, here's a, someone who's paraphrased, um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, in these words, modern language, the passages of Galatians 5, 22 and 23 could read something like this. The fruit of the Spirit is an affectionate, lovable disposition, a radiant spirit and a cheerful temper, a tranquil mind and a quiet manner, a forbearing patience in provoking circumstances and with trying people, a sympathetic insight and tactful helpfulness, generous judgment and a big-souled charity, loyalty and reliableness under all circumstances, humility that forgets self and the joy of others, and all things self-mastered and self-controlled, which is the final mark of perfecting. This is the kind of character that is the fruit of the Spirit. Everything is in the, work, is in the word fruit. It is not by striving, but by abiding. Not by worrying, but by trusting. Not of works but of faith. That's Samuel, I think it's Samuel Chadwick, book on the Holy Spirit. Um, it's quoted in our teacher's Bible study guide. Ellen White put it this way, if the love of the truth is in your heart, you will talk of the truth, you will talk of the blessed hope that you have in Jesus. If you have love in your heart, you will seek to establish and build up your brother in the most holy faith. If a word is dropped that is detrimental to the character of your friend or brother, do not encourage this evil speaking. It is the work of the enemy. Kindly remind the speaker that the word of God forbids that kind of conversation. Review on Herald, June 5, 1888. So, to many people, justification or forgiveness is the very essence of Christianity. So why is it necessary for us to develop self-control and victory over sin? I mean, isn't God happy to be forgiving? Can't we just go on doing what we do and be thankful that God forgives us? Well, some people try to pervert it that way. I heard the evil Rasputin, the monk in Russia, had had that idea that mm -hmm. God's greatest joy came from forgiveness. So the more we <laughs> sin, the more joy God has, which is, of course, a perversion of that. Or another version is that we... Uh, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission, so we just mm -hmm. do whatever we want. Uh, so uh, it, it comes down to the will, my will versus his will. Yeah. Uh, 
do I want to do his will? Here's Ellen White's comments. This is Testimonies for the Church, vo <clears throat> excuse me, volume 5, page 53, second paragraph. What say the testimonies concerning these things? She's discussing Christianity. Even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire cherished, will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. The prevalence of a sinful desire shows a des delusion of the soul. Every indulgence of that desire strengthens the soul's aversion to God. The pains of duty and the pleasures of sin are the cords with which Satan binds men in his snares. Those who would rather die than perform a wrong act are the only ones who will be found faithful. Well, that's scary, huh? What do you think? Is the fruit of the Spirit more important than any gift of the Spirit? Would God dare to bless us with the gifts of the Spirit if we did not have the fruit of the Spirit? I mean, if we didn't have that kind of real Christian love manifested for the people we're trying to reach out to, what's the point of being able to... I mean, if, if you could speak in languages, what's the point if you, if you don't have anything nice to say, anything loving and kind to say? The Spirit came after they came together in one accord. Mm -hmm. Could you be an authentic Christian without the fruit of the Spirit? What would happen to Seventh-day Adventists as a church if we determined to set aside some time each day, each person, to spend quietly with Jesus Christ? How long would it take for us to be transformed? Or is the process of beholding and becoming changed a process that will go on forever? Do we truly honor God and worship Jesus Christ? Do you think of Him as a model for your life? Remember that Jesus said that to love God and our fellow human beings is the essence of Christianity. And modern medical research has discovered that a plant-based diet reduces the risk of heart disease, stroke, most cancers, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. You do not need a different diet to reduce the risk of each one of these diseases. I eating a wide variety of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables reduces not only the risk of coronary artery disease, but also the risk of other killer diseases of the 21st century. So love is like that. If you have love all of these other things we've been talking about will be the result, the fruit that comes as a result of that love. I hope we've managed to challenge your thinking and give you an idea about uh, what this love could mean and wh how, what it, how it could transform our church. Our kind and loving Father, we praise you, we thank you for making these lessons very clear for showing us the results of having a true Christ-like love. May that be our goal each day and each week that we may become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.